quiet up here. Nothing green up here yet. There's no bear food, so all the bears come out of their holes. They've already gone down valley bottom. There could be some stragglers up here, but as soon as the green, as soon as the green's up, up to here, then uh, then they'll be here <laughs> all around me. Let's get right into some sharing here. My name is Jesse Thompson. I live in Duval, Washington. Born and raised in Maui. Got it for several seasons in the Nushagak, Togiak, Ungalikthlathlith, <laughs> and uh, Ungalik. My first experience was at King Camp on Nushagak. We had just set up camp and it was the first night we fired up the big generator. Six of us. Five stayed up drinking until mildly until 3 a.m. At 2.30 a.m., two moose walked right into camp and stood, stood to us right next to the fire for five minutes. No shit. They just stood there. They looked scared and it was weird. So we decided to go to bed around 4 a.m. The only person who hasn't drank at all yet also stayed up with us, woke me up with his eyes as big as dinner plates, and he couldn't talk. He's just saying, look, 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 I can't look, look, what is this? You got to just look, and mumbling. So I went and looked, and there were tracks from a really big human-looking foot. I wear, I wear size 13 double E, and it was two times the length and two times the width. I have picks, but it was an old-school flip-flown days. They aren't great. They aren't great decent. The ones that sold me were where it went up the mighty bank. You could see where it had lost traction two times, and the toes curled, and the mug was raised in between the toes as it slid. No possible way to fake this. Our camp is a hundred yards below the Iowithla River on the Nushagak, for reference. First guest showed up at camp, and I noticed the beaver lodge across from camp was absolutely demolished. It was on a point going into a sleuth, it got about one foot deep, and as I trimmed up my kicker before I hit bottom, I saw three sets of huge prints. And as I saw them, the boat hit and mucked everything up, and I could not see or show anyone else, but I know what I saw. The Beaver Lodge was a monster, the size of a VW bug, and it was demolished. I told an old-timer about this in Dillingham, and he said, hairy men like the young beavers? He also said one time he heard two hairy men talking about how they was going to divide him up who was getting his liver and such. He said he woke up, said, don't eat me, I'm of you, and they walked away. I asked how he knew what they were saying. He said they speak upic. Some of us don't die, we just turn into hairy men. And Dillingham, Equok, village area, has tons of sightings. I always believed this summer just set in stone. My last summer at Lake Alagnekek, Alagnekek, Maybe. If you share it, that is. I was doing an I was doing an evening fish with one guest after dinner. We were gonna go fish Sunshine Creek. It was July, lots of light left, good tipper, and I got to fish, so I was happy to take them. I'll send a map and some pics for reference. Next email with my big footprint pics. So we're all cruising across the lake in the John boat, and over that lily creek I see a figure standing at the creek mouth. I thought, hmm. Strange, no boat, and there's nobody around. Hadn't seen any boats go by the lodge. Maybe he's in trouble. So I veer that way. I'm about 1,000 yards away at this point, which hindsight showed me what I really saw amongst other clues. So as I get to about 500 yards, this figure is hunched over looking in the water like a hairy man watching fish. Again, hindsight. I'm thinking no boat, no fishing pole. I can see between this figure's legs and it is standing upright. It has to be a man. Maybe he's setting a net. 300 yards, still no boat, no fishing pole, no net buoys. 100 yards. I shout, are you okay? And power down. The figure doesn't look up, just walks up the creek mouth and up the bank at the point. I knew it all clicked. The figure doesn't look up, just walks up the creek mouth and up the bank. At that point, I knew it all clicked. My guest hadn't said a word the entire time. I got back on the step and headed towards our fishing destination with goosebumps, head spinning, no words spoken between us. I'm figuring maybe my guest was asleep or just half-wasted so he didn't even notice. I'm not seeing anything. So I go for about 50 minutes to sunshine, complete silence. I land the boat, throw the anchor, get on shore and start rigging our rods. This MFR stands up and almost yells, but in a funny nice way and says, Hey, are we seriously not going to talk about the Bigfoot we just saw? I looked up and smiled and said, Did you see that? He said, 
how could I miss it? What the F? After much discussion and telling him my previous stories, I told him, what should we do? We have no proof. Everyone will think we're crazy, or they would try and go and find him and tell me that wasn't the coolest thing you've ever seen. He agreed. We said nothing. We did not go back and reenact what we saw. And when I stood approximately, we did go back and reenact what we saw. And when I stood approximately where the hairy man was, the creek was up to my chest. And I am 5'11", and I couldn't see in between his legs. And I could see in between his legs when he was fishing. Also, when we got to the bank, no tracks. We was able to make out over a six-foot stride into the bush and leaves. Also, when we got back to the bank, no tracks. He was able to make over a six-foot stride into the bush and leave zero evidence. Goosebumps just thinking about it again. The story, I, the first story I ever heard you tell was about Grizz and reloads from a friend and how you had the same bullet all season. You're an amazing, you're an amazing storyteller and stories are important. I feel a lot of today's problems could be solved if everyone knew their story, as in where they came from, who their ancestors, ancestors are, and had a story their own life. We are very disconnected from Mother Nature as a whole on a societal level. In other news, if you haven't heard, my friend definitely get on board with the QAnon. Q Alerts is a great site. It's worldwide the Great Awakening. WWG1WGA, where we go, no one. Where we go, one, we all go. We go where we go, one, we go all. As much as you know about government censorship, I'm sure you may already know. Stay safe, keep the stories coming. This is amazing content. Jesse. Jesse Thompson. Jesse, appreciate the share. What an incredible sight that must have been, man. And especially to uh, to not have seen any sign, which is a little mind-boggling, right? And a little frustrating. And it's been reported more than a handful of times. A friend of mine's girlfriend, she saw one of these things up the road here. And the headlights, and there was snow on the ground. I went and looked the next day. She was apparently crying, crying her eyes out to her boyfriend, telling him about it. I went and looked, and there wasn't a track everywhere. And I actually waded across the river up to my waist. It was minus 10 to go see if it was perhaps on the other side of the river, and I didn't find any tracks there either. But uh, something upset her enough to make her cry her eyes out and shit herself that evening driving her car down the road. Man, the bugs are getting thick. I'm going to dig out the bug dope here pretty quick. Titled, Killed It. I'm a retired Captain Green. I served for 12 years, including my last six years under 7th Infantry Division, Fort Lewis, McCord. I'm going to make this short, but to the point. On many night trainings, we would load up for night ops in the woods on the southeast part of the Fort Lewis base. During those trainings, we would encounter these creatures quite often. We know they're there. We are told not to engage them in any way. I know back a few years ago, a couple E1s got scared and they emptied a few clips into a large male creature. Yes, they killed it. Within two hours, we had people, my guess feds, crawling all over the place. These people, feds, left after talking with the two guys who killed the creature. I watched as they left in a large vehicle that was loaded down. Yes, these creatures exist. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Grassman. P.S. Speaking with a few fellow army officers I've met, they too have encountered some of these creatures on other bases. Retired Captain Green, thank you Steve for everything you're doing. And there is one hell of a short, straight to the point experience and story. Now, sir, if you could, if you could possibly share with us exactly what it is the military, possibly scientists, what, what words do they use specifically directed to you when they tell you not to say anything or when they tell you not to engage these things? Like, I mean, they've got to give you guys some kind of an explanation as to what these things are and how significant they may be to be kept alive and not messed with and what would that cause if they were killed or attacked unprovoked right uh, i know the military is listening to me i know the law enforcement is listening to me i know numerous scientists are listening to me uh, lots of you people are starting to share and get confidence to share through me with the people hopefully you're seeing the importance of community again They're not supposed to be secrets right it's just not supposed to be we all deserve a fair crack of the knowledge. But uh, I am very, very, very curious as to exactly what the delivery is to the personnel when you are specifically told not to engage these beings. What What is the explanation you're given as to what these beings are and what their purpose is? 
and what are the dangers towards what are the dangers that are uh, towards us if any of you could possibly email back and share some answers to those questions i would i know the 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 over six million people a month listening here would uh, greatly appreciate your words and your wisdom and your knowledge It'd be greatly appreciated i don't know what more i can do to encourage you to share with us except just to ask and plead <laughs> and uh and consider the people your community again you know it's not you guys against us or us against them you know it shouldn't be anyway But anyway, moving along, hopefully that camera's still recording. I think I'll let this camera do one more video and I'll switch up cameras. Because I know the uh, Sony doesn't die. Dear Steve, I'm watching Steve. Dear Steve, I'm watching your channel for about six months and I thought I would share a few strange events that have happened to me in the past year. My name is Eric. I live in central Missouri. I've lived here my whole life on a vacation spot called Lake of the Ozarks. I grew up spending every day in the woods like most people I've seen posting on your channel. I've never had any strange incidents happen to me except until this last year. I'll try to give this short. I'll try to keep this short, but apologies if I start rambling. About a year ago, I met a friend who was really into arrowhead hunting. We started hunting arrowheads together near his home, located by a state park and tourist attraction called Swinging Bridge. The first strange encounter happened one night when we were camping along the river. I was in my tent around midnight, and my buddy was at the river's edge night hunting. Anytime I refer to hunting, it's meant as arrowhead hunting. Anyway, suddenly a tent is hit by a rock. Not a large rock, but big enough to make the sound of a rock hitting gravel after it bounced off my tent. I thought I was Travis fooling around, and about a minute later it happened again. I went outside to confront Travis about it, and he just shrugged me off, thinking I was paying, playing some sort of a gag on him. Later that night, we were both hunting together in the river when Travis needed a new flashlight. He went up to his truck maybe 50 yards away, and just when he reached it, it was hit by a rock. So, this begins our strange journey of weird stuff in the woods. That night, we had, a, I think, five or six more rocks thrown. Not at us, but always landing five to ten feet away. We hunt all over central Missouri, but only have strange things happen on this one stretch of river near the swinging bridge. We usually hunt at night because it's cooler and arrowheads are easier to see in the water. After this first rock throwing event, it started to happen more often. Rocks were thrown when we were on our way out never heading through the woods to the river, but only when we were leaving. It has become so often that many times you don't even react to it or say anything to each other. We have taken several other people who don't believe us out there, and they have all seen it for themselves. Rarely, rarely anymore can we go hunting there without the goodbye rocks on the way out. In fact, if we're leaving and nothing's been thrown, one of us will say, well, it's about time for the rocks, and most of the time a rock will hit nearby afterwards. This went on all last spring and summer, and we just got used to it. We both have flashlights that we call the God Illuminators. They are 100,000 lumens, and we can light up the woods like an airport runway, but I've never seen, heard, or smelt anything, just rocks hitting all around us. Until one night about two months ago. We're hunting a riverbank we call the Big Bank. I was on one end, and my buddy was on the other, about 100 yards away. I had two or three rocks thrown near me, so I walked down to where he was, and he said nothing had happened on his end. We walked back to where I had been, and I wandered down by the river's edge while Travis stayed by the wood line. About ten minutes later, I looked up, and Travis was waving furiously at me with a look on his face I had never seen. I thought he must have found a nice point, so I wasn't in a hurry to get there until I noticed that he was filming something in the woods. I got back to him, and he said, something growled at me. We don't have bears here. The woods are mainly full of deer and small animals. As I looked into the woods, I saw two sets of green eyes glowing in our flashlight beams. Neither of us had our big lights that night and couldn't light up the entire woods. The eyes were about 25 yards away and about 5 feet or so off the ground. At first, I thought they were deer and couldn't figure out why they were running off. Just then, one set of eyes went from 5 feet off the ground straight up to about 10 feet. Nothing I know could do this. Even a deer standing on his hind legs could not stand up for long. It was like something was crouching, and then it stood straight up. I just couldn't get my light to shine far enough to show them up, to light them up. Just the glow of their eyes. I made sure I knew the exact spot they were at so I could go look at the prints they made. It was really muddy that night, and even though I knew deer didn't act like this, I tried to convince myself that there would be deer tracks all over the spot where we were seeing the eyes. 
We filmed it for about three minutes, and then the eyes were gone. We quickly went to the spot and seen them and nothing. Not a single print or anything. Our boots were four inches in muddy slop, yet not a single track. It was the first night that we were both ever really scared in the woods. We walked back to the riverbank and we were trying to play back the recording when a huge crash of the wood line scared the crap out of us. We walked back up to where we had just left and found a tree about 20 feet long, maybe 10 inches wide, had been thrown at the bank from deeper in the woods. There were no roots or limbs, and both ends appeared to have been broken off. No human or anything else I know about could have lifted, let alone tossed a tree that size. We searched the area and could not find where it came from. Since then, I've had several other strange things happen to me in the woods, including an incident where I experienced what I can only describe as a teleportation from one place in the woods to another a long ways away. And that's another story. I used to love hunting alone at night, but now I would never think about doing it. One question that me and Travis always talk about is why do the rocks always land with a thud, as if they're falling straight down? If I threw a rock at something a long ways away, it would hit and bounce off the ground or skip off the water. Also, if they're being thrown from inside the woods to out the river, why don't we ever hear one hitting branches or trees? There's never any sound until it just drops the single plunk near us. Nothing would be so accurate as to throw a rock out of the woods and never hit anything on the way. Also, I keep asking myself, why would this thing obviously is, is that obviously this thing is hiding from us? Also, I keep asking myself, why would this thing that obviously is hiding from us want to throw rocks as we're leaving? Part of me wants to see what this is, but I fully understand that seeing it would ruin my love of the, of the woods. That being said, the last thing I want to throw out there, and I've never heard anyone suggest this, and I get laughed at and mocked every time I try to bring it up is, what if Big, could, Bigfoot could fly? It's okay to laugh. I only say this because of the rock seemingly being dropped from straight above, and I've heard loud flapping noises above me several times. Keep up the great work you're doing. It has inspired me to not care if people think I'm crazy. You're welcome to use mine and Travis's names because everyone thinks we are loco already. All right, man, you're not loco. You know you're not. You've read from far too many people who have reported basically the same thing, right? It is what it is. Nothing to be ashamed of. You didn't ask for it, right? Nobody asked for this shit. That's the thing. That's the thing that's kind of frustrating and potentially maddening about it is nobody asked for this, yet uh, the majority of society is more than willing to shit on people to come forward and, and generously share what they witnessed with their community. Isn't that bullshit? I guess we're turning that around, right? We're making it change. But anyway, I can't explain the rocks dropping from the sky. I can't. I got a, I got a couple of ideas, a couple of theories, possibly has something to do with the next parallel dimensions, possibly, possibly, portals, possibly, right? It's just, it's just a few things that need to be looked into and, and, and uh, spoke about out loud. There are scientists who are avidly looking into portals. It just is, all right? It's not being made up. Don't shoot the messenger. The messenger will shoot back, and the messenger is pretty damn accurate. Yeah, well, what else do we have? Man, it sure gets cool up here once that sun goes behind a cloud. No wonder there's a bunch of snow still up here. Mr. Isdall, I want to start off by stating how much I appreciate your efforts to bring this topic up to a level of respect and credibility it is long deserved. I've watched your channel on YouTube for about a year now and appreciate your no-nonsense, BS-free approach when it comes to discussion on this topic. Your work is being noticed and appreciated by many people, so thank you. I know you have my full support 110%. Thank you very much for those kind and supportive words. And uh, this channel and what I do is nothing without you and everybody else. This is all a community effort. With that aside, I relate to you my story. This will be a bit lengthy, but it'll be as concise as, as possible while retaining the accuracy of my account. First, a bit of background on myself. My name is Patrick Bell. Feel free to use my name if you wish. I'm a 22-year-old college graduate living in western Kentucky area right on the Ohio River. I grew up in a little town called Ledbetter. Man, I got bugs climbing up my nose and my ear. They're everywhere. And this was the location of the setting I will detail in a moment. I will state, since I believe it to be relevant, that I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I've been for most of my life. I have what I would describe as an unusual sensitivity to spiritual and metaphysical things. 
For the record, I'm not claiming I'm a better superior to anyone in any way. I'm merely stating that some of us happen to have certain gifts from a spiritual perspective, and intuition has always been one of mine. I believe it is largely due to the great amount of time I've spent out in nature and in the outdoors. There's something about being in nature away from plasma screens that refines one's sixth sense. I grew up spending my summers on the family farm in central Kentucky and had a number of strange experiences even at a young age, though I lacked the knowledge on this topic at that time to understand what was happening. But there were certain times growing up when I would get odd feeling in the woods or my sixth sense would warn me to stay away from a certain area, especially the farm's numerous creek beds during nighttime hours. Occasionally cattle would come up dead with their heads ripped off and other horrific injuries like that just to give you an example of the sort of activity we saw. But all that aside, I will describe my encounter to you. It was late, around 11 p.m. on the night of Sunday, August 30th of this year. I spent a few hours visiting a group of friends that lived just a half a mile or so away from my house in Leadbetter. I come over for the night and help them move around some things in their shed. Using the flashlight, I keep my truck to assist in providing visibility so we could move around safely as their shed is in a partially forested area that is also located near a large drop-off at the tree line. We just finished storing all the boxes and miscellaneous items. I told my group of buddies to go on back inside while I parked my truck in the driveway since I was done using it. I did so, moving it within about 30 yards of the house before exiting and standing at the rear of my vehicle to ensure I wasn't blocking the driveway in case someone else drove by. It was a small, narrow gravel drive. As soon as my feet hit the gravel at the back of my trunk, I got a very sudden, powerful feeling of anxiousness. I wasn't quite scared, but uneasy and I had a very distinct sense that something was watching me. As soon as the thought fully registered in my mind, I got a sort of a mental ping in my head that told me the direction of the threat. I can't explain it better than that. All I know is I just knew somehow that there was something in the tall grass just beyond the edge of the tree line behind the shed we had just been organizing. So I instinctively pulled my light and hit the brightness setting to illuminate the area. The millisecond my beam hit the trees, I saw two bright white within white shapes, like bright eyes glaring at me from the darkness. I wanted to be perfectly clear here. These were not the eyes of a dog, cat, or any animal I've ever seen. I know this for three reasons. Number one, the eyes did not reflect my flashlight. They were brighter than my light. It's hard to describe, but it's like I was shining my light directly into a powerful floodlight. Try it sometime. Basically, the light within these eyes had a source of its own. It wasn't reflecting my light, with that obvious eye shine effect that a cat or dog will give off. I was like, it was like two bright white fluorescent lights that were outshining my flashlight. The flashlight, that by the way, will illuminate a hundred yards of open field like a rock concert on the maximum power setting. Number two, the eyes were not golden, red, or orange in color, like some eyes reflecting light can be. They were the purest shade of white I've ever seen, like enamel white, or the white color of the moon on a night when it's out in full. It was white within white in color. Number three, the eyes were not circular or spherical like a human set of eyes, nor were they the right width apart to be human. As I already said, they did not match up with any set of eyes I've ever seen in nature. The closest thing I can compare it to is the eyes of the alien creature in the 1987 movie Predator. That one scene where the predator's eyes light up like two bright lights, except the eyes were white and not yellow. That was what it looked like when my light hit it. The other thing that reminded me of Predator was the fact that I saw nobody. It was just the eyes peering out at me from the tall, thick brush and the rough backdrop of the tree line. It could be that it had positioned itself well enough that I could see its eyes without obstruction while still hiding its body. But if this is not the case, it must have been invisible to me by some other means that remains unclear to me at this time. All I know is those eyes appeared the moment my beam hit the trees. Now, Steve, I wish I could tell you I just made this crap up, but this is where things get a little weird. A lot of things happen in very quick succession when my beam of light hit this thing. Firstly, I immediately became acutely aware of the fact there was absolutely zero sound. Take into account that this is a two-lane highway running just a few hundred yards from the house and there is a big creek not even 300 yards down the steep embankment before I'm seeing these eyes. Every time, I've been able to, every time I've been to this location at night, you can hear either crickets, birds, cars, or some other form of natural noise, like the trees swing or the wind blowing, but not in this situation. There is absolutely no noise. I'm not sure if I was standing still because my mind was completely fixed on this thing I was seeing, but I couldn't even hear gravel moving under my feet, so I must have been 
dead still. I just wanted to point out the sound details before we get into the juicy stuff. On the silence register in my head, I found myself maintaining eye contact with, those, with these eyes. They blinked or went out once, the white light disappearing into the darkness before suddenly the eyes appeared again. It appeared to my best knowledge that the being in front of me had blinked. As soon as the eyes reappeared, I thought a thought popped into my head as clear as any thought in my mind, but it was not my thought. It said to me, I am watching you. At this point, I remained calm. My senses did not alert to me to any threat to my physical person, but to say I was a bit unnerved would be a massive understatement. The two of us maintained eye contact in a total silence for it had to be at least five to ten seconds, but it could have been a little bit more or less. I was so focused that I wasn't keeping time well to be honest. All I know for certain is I heard a voice speak to me very clearly that was not my own. I should mention at this point that I carry a gun with me almost everywhere I go. A 1911 chambered in 45 ACP. It was practically a part of my body at this point. I spent inordinate amounts of time trying to master its use for self-defense purposes and have received extensive training in its operation. I say this to you because what happened next truly baffles me. You'd think that any reasonable person in this situation would enter the usual fight or flight response. I'm familiar with this response through personal experience. A person's heart rate and breathing picks up, their blood pressure climbs, fine motor skills go into the toilet and their adrenaline starts flowing. You start to make very important decisions on an instinctive, almost subconscious level as you react to what is in front of you. I've entered several situations in my life where I've had to act evasively in self-defense towards other human beings, and without fail, I naturally entered this state each and every time. My instincts, instincts took over at each of these occasions, but not this time. It was as if something else suppressed and overpowered those instincts, instincts I spent all my life refining, and assuring me I did not need to be afraid. My reaction as a result was pure, utter calm. I can't explain it, except to cite scriptures which speak, speak of peace beyond understanding as a blessing of God's providence. All I know is I did not try to reach in my pocket for my keys to flee, nor did I turn to run as I felt given to sing my back would be a rather poor notion to say the least. I simply maintained eye contact and stood my ground. Not really brave nor afraid, just at peace. I did not think about reaching for my gun on sheer instinct, but the moment I thought it, another voice popped into my head. I couldn't make this up if I tried. It said to me, don't reach for your gun, it won't help you. You need not be afraid. It's like a subconscious thing. I can't really describe it, and if you don't believe me, I totally understand. To be honest, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it, and I'm the one writing this account, so your guess is as good as mine. I've read a lot about guardian angels speaking to people and protecting them. Perhaps that is what it was. All I know is that it wasn't me. I do not have that thought any more than the thought the creature put into my head. The two thoughts were 100% independent of my own consciousness. On the voice in my mind told me not to go for my gun and not to be afraid. I went for the only other weapon I carry with me everywhere. I started quoting Bible, Bible verses I had memorized as a kid. I can't remember all what I said. I just, it just come to me. But I remember a couple of verses I quoted, and for the sake of accuracy, I'll include, I'll include them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. As I spoke the words, the eyes remained watching me. Once I finished with the verses, I simply said, In the name of Jesus Christ, be gone from me. The moment I said that sentence, for precise instant it left my mouth, I heard a loud audible crack, and I can only describe as a big branch snapping under pressure. At that moment of the sound, the eyes vanished, the feelings of anxiousness and uneasiness dissipated, and my sense of sound finally returned as I heard cars on the nearby highway and the sound of trees swaying once more in the gentle wind. My feet were no longer locked into place as I could hear the gravel under my steel-toed boots crunching softly as I shifted stands. For all I knew, the world was back to normal, as if what I just went through had never happened. The whole encounter from start to finish probably lasted no longer than 30 seconds at the absolute maximum. But again, it could be a bit less or maybe even more. My sense of time was obscured in a way I can't fully understand, much like my ability to perceive sound. It was definitely odd how focused I became on this thing, but that's a discussion for another time. 
As a result of my encounter, I decided to do a bit of investigation that I might satisfy my curiosity. I took a friend out to the site the next day and had him stand in the same spot where I saw the eyes do a size comparison, or at least give me some idea as to how tall the thing must have been since technically the eyes were all I saw. Take into account that my friend is six foot one. Top of that, as I said earlier, there is a steep drop off behind the shed where the eyes appeared. It is around two and a half to three feet straight down, so however tall the creature appeared in the comparison to me from my altitude at the time, it had to be at least two or three feet taller. That being said, my friend stood at the edge of the drop off and looked out at me from the edge of the tree line. I set it up this way with both of us on even ground so I would have an ultra conservative height to work with, since again, However tall it appeared on our level, it would have to have been at least two to three feet higher since it was standing at the bottom of the lip behind the shed. What hit me when I saw my friend standing there was mind-blowing. The top of his head was about level with where the eyes were, meaning that creature I saw had to be at the absolute bare minimum two and a half feet taller than my six-foot-one friend. This realization was bone-chilling to say the least. Once we both realized this, we just walked back to the car in silence. We didn't speak about it any, af any more after that. I told a few people close to me about this story, and my, only, my dad fully believed me and would listen to the full account. Well, that is all the detail I can remember. I hope this account is helpful to someone out there and perhaps illuminating into the strange things occurring on this strange little planet of ours. Please, thanks for reading this long essay, Mr. Isdell. I greatly appreciate it again. I wish you a good day, sir. God bless you and keep you safe as you go about your way. Appreciate all that you do, and we look forward to seeing what you get into in the future. Patrick Bell. Patrick, that is one hell of an experience. And obviously... Uh, Obviously, uh, you've heard that exact same description and experience. Um, you've heard that shared here in this channel without a doubt. Um, I can't explain it. I don't have the answers. I know I know there are people out there that do have the answers, and uh, hopefully they're being coaxed into sharing with us exactly what's going on. There's some crazy, crazy-ass shit going on. <laughs> That's just all there is to it. The more, the more people share, and the more we're going to learn quicker, and the more we can possibly help people live a more fuller life, right? And not stay indoors, running around scared and terrified while we are lied to, misled, manipulated.